Uh, yeah. Okay. So 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 because we have we're supposed to have enough time, uh, I'll go slowly and I'll give a lot of uh, introduction. Uh, I'll try to make there, there's a like a theorem that I'm going to which relates nodal which relates nodal count on graphs with magnetic perturbations. Uh, so I think the first hour would be just going to that theorem and defining the whole uh, situation that we're talking about and maybe giving some um, relations to the physical, uh, to the physics uh, models that are related. And uh, in, the la in the second talk, in the second hour, I'll give the proof, uh, which I'm very, I was very interested in giving this proof for this audience because I think it gives a lot of uh, motivation and like understanding of the, the problem. Uh, pretty much anything that I'm going to talk here to talk about is not my work. So I want to make, to, to emphasize this, this is not to talk about my work. Um, okay, so maybe I'll, I'll start with just a bit of like, a, a bit of like loose motivation for nodal, for nodal problems. So th this, so nodal, Problems. So goes back, I think, to the sixteenth uh, to eighteenth century. If we let ourselves to be loose on what we count as nodal problems, uh, with names such as Galileo, Leonardo da Vinci, Hooke, all of the great physicist of that time uh, and they, they were interested in 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 uh, all kind of resonance patterns and wave patterns and the most classic example that one the, of um, an experiment that later on uh, these these days it is usually uh, it, it is usually goes by the name of Chladni, Chladni's figures. And just take a metal plate, throw some sand on it. And force it to vibrate according to some uh, frequency. So the way that they did it in that in these centuries was just using a, a violin bow. Uh, so you can you can with your with how fast you're doing the, the, this movement, you can you can um, force the plate to move in different frequencies. And in most frequencies that you're doing nothing extraordinary happens, but when you get to a resonance frequency, suddenly the sand accumulates in certain beautiful patterns. And, and the interesting thing as a physicist is that these patterns return. It's not that it just randomly choose a pattern. These patterns, when you repeat the instrument with the same as the, with the same shape of metal and the same and the same frequency, you get the same pattern. And what happens today, we can say that uh, if we have some kind of a function of displacement of the sand at a point, so this would be location and this would be time. So once we get into a resonance frequency, we're actually this function actually looks like a function only of the location times some periodic function only of the time. So this is what we call a standing wave. And this F, very roughly speaking, is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian with eigenvalue, which is related to this uh, time frequency according to some 
speed of that relates to the, the physical quantities of this problem. So that's an eigenfunction. If we're looking at this thing from the side, then we have, we have the sand here and the sand and the sand jump up and down, but its amplitude is governed by this special function. And in particular, if we add a part a, a sand here, it would drift into the place where the resonating function doesn't move. So essentially, what we are looking at here in this pattern is the set x such that fx is zero. And these sets, this is, these points are the points that I call nodal points. These sets are the, the, the set that we're call, calling nodal sets. And the domains that we see here, we call them nodal domains. So that's like a very, very, very uh, hand waving uh, background of nodal problems. Now it start to get more mathematically rigorous. Uh, around 1836, where Sturm shows that essentially on an interval, and I'm vague here because there, there are a lot of details and we can talk about Sturm field operators and I don't want to do that. So essentially just think about the Laplacian, about functions, functions that satisfy that are eigenfunction of the Laplacian, of the one dimensional Laplacian, and say vanish at the two endpoints. So we will see that the first, that the first eigenvalue, the first eigenfunction would look like that. The second eigenfunction would look like that. The third eigenfunction would look like that. And if we We can count. So now we, we can either, we want to count something and we can either count the domains on which the, uh, the eigenfunction doesn't vanish or count the points on which the eigenfunction vanish. The two are related, obviously. Uh, let's say that, and, and Sturm proved that uh, the number of points uh, such that the n eigen function vanish is n minus one. So essentially, just counting these points, I know which on which eigen function I'm looking at, and this is where it starts to be mathematic. And the next point in our journey is Courant. Uh, Hilbert student from Gottingen, where which in 1923 uh, showed that uh, for say that we have some kind of a domain in the plane. We're taking some kind of a nice domain in the plane, and we can talk about the problem of lambda f equal the f equal lambda f and f at the boundary of our domain vanish. And now there's no point of talking of counting nodal points. We, we will count nodal domains. We will count nodal domains, and what Kuban shows is that the number of nodal domains of the n eigen function is bounded bounded above by n, uh, which is 
exactly what we have there. And actually, the, although current only talks about uh, only talked about the about the Richelieu boundary condition and plane and domains in the plane, uh, his proof is very robust and holds for almost any domain. If we're talking about uh, if we're talking about high dimensional manifold, if we're talking about different uh, different boundary values, different values of uh, the boundary, and even as we will see later on in the case of uh, graphs. Okay, so now at this point we are. Uh, getting into the realm of like actual mathematics, and now, uh, and now we're starting to, and now there's like a lot of uh, results. Well, probably in the in the last uh, few decades, uh, which I don't want to get into because I want to take this talk to the to the realm of graphs. So here we can either continue with talking about manifolds or go and talking about graphs. Uh, some, something that I really just want to, to mention briefly, and I'm not going to write any references because I probably miss a lot of things. Uh, so, um, well, Let's call this uh, top, top results today. So we have two kinds of results when we're talking about manifolds. One, which one can say that maybe the analog of counting nodal points is not uh, is not counting nodal domains, but actually the n minus one dimensional measure of the nodal set. So. We have STL conjectured that the Hausdorff n minus one dimension of the um, let's call it D minus one of the zero set of the n eigen value uh, should grow like the square root of lambda n. And it's a very rough, there, there's a lot to be said about this conjecture. And this conjecture was recently uh, proved for every, every manifold or domain with a nice enough boundary. Uh, by uh, the, the latest results are by Alex Lagunov and, and uh, Evgenia um, Malkova. And a, diff, a totally different uh, direction is counting nodal domains of random eigenfunctions. So a lot, a lot of the time we would ask what happens if we take a random. And so nodal count of random eigenfunctions, and this would uh, probably be interesting for the people here that are more coming from a more probabilistic point of view, because eventually when, when we're looking at eigenfunctions which are high enough in the spectrum, a random eigenfunction would look like a Gaussian free field with a very specific, uh, with, with a very specific kernel. And this approach that I believe started with uh, Sodin and Azarov on random eigenfunction, random spherical harmonics on the sphere. And later on was really, the, the, uh, the, there was a sequence of beautiful works I think one of one that should be mentioned is the, the work of uh, Peter Sarma, Kibo Bigman, and, and uh, Shaiza Kanzani, uh, where they show that for random eigenfunction, uh, pretty much the nodal domains can pretty much look like any uh, lower dimensional manifold. 
and they can actually classify their topology and say in which frequency they appear. Uh, so, so again, there's like can you explain what you mean by random eigenfunctions. Are you are you um, looking at the sphere, or I mean, I know that's one of the cases. So, so yeah, okay. First of all, that's definitely not part of okay. the direction of my talk. But yeah, but uh, what do I mean by that? So, for example, if in the sphere, you in the sphere you take uh, you can you can take just uh, and the or in any situation you're going to a certain eigenvalue and say that the eigenvalue is degenerate. So choose a, you need you need the degeneracy to, to make to make this work right or yeah. And if you're not in a degenerate case, you can take a window, you can take a spectral window and take. But you're, you're taking a spectral window or a degenerate eigenspace, uh, choose a, a random, okay. cho choose some eigenvectors, uh, and then give them coefficients which are IID Gaussians. So this would give you would give you a, a random eigenfunction. Okay. When the energy goes high, or when you are very localized around the point blowing up your surface. This looks like a Gaussian free field with a very, very specific uh, covariance matrix, which unfortunately is not positive and hence a lot of problems arise. And later on, the, the last results in this thing regarding to some percolation model that is supposed to tell us if we're going to see a, a huge nodal domain or not, or a huge nodal set or not, uh, a work by Hugo, uh, Hugo Domini uh, and, and his collaborators. What? Domini Copa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think this is everything I'm going to say about nodal problems. Which, are, which is not related to graphs. And now let me start about talking. Let me, let me start talking about graphs. So, So the one you're going to write on is not, I mean, you can't move it up. So just this place is full of surprises. Uh, oh, uh, something that I forgot to mention, which another, another very important motivation in all of these random eigenfunctions is that there are several quantum chaos related conjectures uh, that uh, conjecture that the nodal that the nodal count should have the, 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 the nodal count if we're looking at it as a distribution as some sequence of random numbers that coming one after the other should uh, have a certain universal uh, should have certain universal properties uh, that show us that that show us the randomness of the of the system of the, the chaoticity of the system, and that's a very very vague thing what I just said. Uh, but I will when once I'll I'll present the main uh, theorem I will actually tell you about a certain numerical work that we're now doing in that direction. Okay, so. Up to this point, it was very, uh, very vague. Now let me start uh, with giving actual uh, mathematical uh, statements. So, um, magic equation. Other count on graphs. <laughs> uh, 
the, what, what do I mean by nodal counter graph? So first of all, let me define, we start with some graph. So this would be, this would always be finite connected graph. of say yeah, n vertices, capital N vertices. And we consider matrices that are supported on the graph. So what does it mean? So I will say that A is supported on G. So A is going to be uh, a matrix uh, or it's going to be an N, date, N times N if it is an N times N matrix with A I J equal to zero when I not equal to J and I is not an IJ is not an edge, not equal to zero when IJ is an edge and I don't care about what happened on the diagram. In any of the results in this thing, we don't care about what happened on the diagram. And you're not, you're not fixing the value on the edge? You're just saying it's not zero? Well, that, that's, I'm, I'm, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, in a minute, I'm going to get to Schrodinger operators. Uh, okay. How do you do that? So, the actual, the, the actual class of fun of matrices that we are going to look at, which I'll denote by M sub G will be N times N, symmetric matrices supported on G with negative of diagonal. So this is, let me write it as H such that is and I am real symmetric supported on G with entry HIJ strictly smaller than zero on the off diagonals, which are edges. So I'm writing H because from um, coming from mathematical physics and in my interpretation, this is a Hamiltonian or a discrete Schrodinger operator. Uh, what you should have in mind is the Laplacian. Okay, so, so L is the kind of like the central object in this setting. Uh, the Laplacian, so what is the Laplacian? We, we want, we have L i j equal to minus one if i j is an edge and say that it's 
equal to the degree of i if i is equal to j. So essentially, that's a matrix, a diagonal matrix of the degrees minus the adjacency matrix. And let me also write two nice things about it. So first of all, if we just act on a function and we ask what we, what we get at the i's coordinate, so that's summing over all the j neighbors. So I'm summing over j, which is a neighbor, and say that I'm f i minus f j. Okay, and this thing when I'm, I have a function and I'm looking at an edge and looking at the difference, I will call d of f. So, so this would be d of f at the end ij. Okay, so notice that d of f is something that takes a function on the vertices and produce a function on the edges, but a very special type of function, a function that where we, if we plug ji instead of ij, we get a minus. And this is what we're later going to call it one form. And it has a quadratic form. So, uh, Quadratic form. So if we're putting f l f, this would be sum over i, sum over j next to i, f i squared minus f i f j, which is nothing less than summing over all pairs. Summing over all edges, df ij squared. So this is something that I may write as such. And whenever there's a, so here we're actually, this is an inner product on the vertices, this is an inner product on the edges. There's possibly a half missing here. I wouldn't care about it. And if, if there's a, a possible uh, way of misunderstanding, I will denote this with zero and this with one. Uh, this is saying that this is zero. It means a zero form means functions. One mean one forms. Uh, so, And we will a lot of the time discuss these matrices in accordance with their quadratic forms. <laughs> okay. So now I'm almost getting to the point where I define what is the nodal count that I'm looking at. Also need to define how do I number the eigenvalues? So given such a matrix, uh, we'll write its eigenvalues. So I have lambda one, which is actually going to be for the for the Laplacian, it's going to be zero, but in general, it's not. It doesn't have to be zero. And again, recall that we have no restriction whatsoever about the diagonal, so I can always add something as negative as I want and get the spectrum, or as positive as I want. I can get the spectrum which is all negative. I can get the spectrum which is all positive. I care about the ordering. So, first I have lambda one, lambda two lambda three up to lambda capital N. I don't write here less or equal, it's actually less. 
the first eigenvalue is actually going to be simple. And the first eigenfunction is actually the first eigenvector or eigenfunction can actually be taken to have all uh, strictly positive entries. And this is just the Ferron Provenius theorem if we massage a bit the, uh, our equations. And so here I'm using the fact that G is connected. And for each one of these, we have an eigenfunction. So HFN equal to lambda N FN. And I want to define my nodal count. So nodal count would be counting on how many edges my, my function changes the sign. So let me write it as phi N equal to number of I, J, and E such that F and I, F and J is smaller than zero. So the function changes sign. Okay, so maybe just to. So this is more like the measure of the boundary. I mean, more analogous to the men, to. Yes, again, we're at the graph setting. At the graph setting, the two are very much related. Uh, Okay. So it's a once as long as we're on a one-dimensional object or a zero-dimensional object, we can we have a way of playing with the two. But but yes, it's this is this can be thought of as as in Sturm, as in Sturm oscillation theory, where we count one one way of thinking about it as if we're extending an edge between extending a, a a continuous edge along this and, and the eigenfunction going from a positive thing to a negative thing must cross zero. And it's reasonable it's like tree-like or something, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, tree-like then exactly it's like, yeah, exactly. So we can think about having an eigenfunction that is positive on the blue, negative on the red. And so in this situation, I did it a bit yeah, too much. Yeah, a bit too much. So in this situation, we'll have one, two, three, four, another count. And two things that uh, two things that we should ask ourselves at this point is one, what happened if the eigenvalue is not simple? So we have here I'm writing phi n. N is supposed to be related to the nth eigenvalue, but maybe I have more than one eigenfunctions to choose. So we have something which is ill defined. Two, what happens in one of these values is zero. So a standard assumption would be that we're looking at a simple eigenvalue, an eigenfunction that doesn't get zero on the vertices. I will write it down when we get to an actual statement. Okay, so now we have the we have our object that we're the object that we're looking at. Which one I want to take it first? So let me state two theorems uh, before two, two theorems that were known prior to the main result I'm going to discuss, which the main result I'm going to discuss would imply these two theorems. So as John already mentioned, there 
the issue of a tree. First theorem by Fiedler in 1975 says if G is a tree, lambda M simple if then I not equal to zero for a line, then phi n equal to n minus one, just like Sturm oscillation theorem. So in a way, a tree mimics a segment. What happens if you're not on a tree? There were several results between Fitler in 1975 and Berkolaiko in 2007, which I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to go over all the entire history, but that in 2007, under, so for any G, and that this would be our standard assumptions. plus that of assumption so we want something that goes with this thing it's going to be bounded below by n minus one and bounded above by n minus one plus Beta, what is beta? Beta is the first beta number of the graph. So beta equal to the number of edges minus number of vertices plus one. And this is first beta number. So we actually get a characterization that takes inside all of the possible uh, topology. And it works with this thing because a tree is exactly beta equal to zero. So beta equal to zero exactly give you this thing. And the way that Berkolaiko proved it was actually relying on Fiedler's result and using some kind of a perturbative argument saying that going from a graph to a tree, you need to break exactly beta edges <laughs> and showing that each, each time you break an edge, that's a rank one perturbation. And this object cannot move uh, more than one whenever you're doing a rank one perturbation and, and giving this result. result the, the problem with this result is it doesn't really give you what happens. Uh, uh, it doesn't give you anything by hand. And Essentially, if we're looking at this, we have here a lot of room between n minus one and n minus one plus beta. And what I will, if I will get to talk about it, uh, I will try to explain how this is actually uh, usually what we see for random graphs is that the, the value phi n minus n minus one, so this, the deviation that goes between zero and beta, is actually uh, distributed symmetrically around beta over two with a very sharp, a very constant, a very large concentration uh, of variance beta. So it's not really spread and gets to all of these things. Although <coughs> you can get, you can get the lower and the upper bound. It is strict in a sense, but generically speaking, it's going to be much, much more Con concentrated inside. And this is a feature, some kind of uh, universal chaotic, chaotic feature that we're, that we believe uh, that the system has. Yeah. This uh, result for the tree, if you change your nodal count to be uh, less than or equal to zero, does this result hold dropping the assumptions or what happens? 
So essentially for a tree, equal to zero is, uh, equal to zero is, uh, is um, implies multiplicity. So for, for a tree, whenever you have a, an eigenvector that uh, gets a zero on, on, on a vertex, you can always show that. Uh, okay, so, so, so I have a question about that. Do you have, in, in terms of multiplicity, do you have anything to say about the Colin de Verdier invariant that he invented precisely in this context of these, uh, on so, this kind of uh, allowing, you, you fix a graph and you allow the non zero entries. And then there's an invariant he defined, which uh, is quite beautiful. And he showed, you know, use the graph minor theorem to show that uh, it stabilizes, but uh, very hard to compute. Do you have any insight into that from your point of view? Yeah, so first of all, uh, the Colin de Verdier number is exactly defined on this cluster of matrices. Yeah, right. That's why I'm asking. And it's got to do with multiplicity. He was trying to force multiplicity. Uh, exactly. Uh, um, Actually, in the, the proof that I'm going to present now, uh, which exactly tell us what is this difference, is a proof by Colin de Verdier. And in this proof, we can actually say what happens, uh, what happens when we have multiplicity, and it's essentially going to be, the multiplicity essentially going to add us another, uh, like, and we, we will need to add the multiplicity uh, to the, right, so you'll get into that and maybe tell us about his invariant. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the uh, computer I science. Okay, like the <laughs> uh, okay. Let's do a break now, and then we'll get back to. Oh, I didn't want to stop you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I think it's uh, the right time to stop. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's do a five minute, five minute break. Yeah, five minute break. Sounds good. Okay, it was slower than I intended. I guess that's a good thing. Should I uh should I go faster? Yes. Um, I mean, I guess now it's going to be a bit more like there's going to be more. Uh, yeah. So. Let's let me say it was, to my opinion, it was not too fast. Okay. You always know, said whenever you have a zero on the eigenfunction, it means that you must have a multiplicity on, on a this. three. What what? On a three. Ah, okay. Definitely not all yeah, yeah. enough. Okay, okay. But it, whenever you have a um, so whenever you have, whenever it happens on a vertex which uh, removing it disconnect the graph. So so all all vertices of a tree. Actually, I'm when when you have vertices of a tree, when you remove a vertex, you disconnect the graph. 
zero needs yeah, to yeah, but, but it's then, hyper local. And, and I'm and missing it, something. If you take a path of length five, like five vertices, then you have an eigenvalue that looks like up, down, down, up. Like basically like a sine function with one positive and one negative. In the middle, it's zero. I, uh, okay. This is if, not, if it uh, happens on a if if it happens on a vertex of degree, uh, if it happens on a vertex of degree three and higher. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. That's like the uh, on a vertex of degree three and higher. I see why you can kind of disconnect it and say now exactly. Two, uh, and, and then and then now we see yeah. that plane. Okay. Got it. Like it, a vertex of degree two is kind of. Dumb it's the, it's kind of like right, you know if in the continuous setting it's a removable single yeah, yeah, exactly. and a vertex of degree one is like <laughs> yeah sure uh, let me know where can I when when should I continue Not really enough room here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, not ideal for talks, but uh, but you must have been practicing on this on this board. You you seem to know how to make them work. Are you, are you kidding me? No, no. I'm, I, I, I'm I I'm I I feel like so. No, uh, I mean I I thought you did pretty well. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I. I... <laughs> My first time, no, my second, I, I talked here in the oh, you did, you in, in my first uh, 15 minute uh, postdoc talk. Ah, okay. In here, in this room. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you, you have to have some skill with these boards. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, this is just do it quite a bit because they had all their seminars in here. Yeah. Now, it, it, it kind of like makes you, you need to, to Plan ahead. You need to plan ahead, and I'm, I'm very not the plan ahead kind of person. <laughs> like, okay, doing the juggling with this. I think you can continue. Okay, so okay, so now I'm going to, to introduce something, uh, some perturbation to this model, and essentially we're going to show that. Uh, that the nodal count or the difference of the nodal count from n minus one equal to this to some index with respect to this perturbation. So, and this perturbation has a lot of physical meaning, uh, but it's very simple. So, say that a is any a which is uh, self-adjoint. So, I don't want it to be real. I want it to be self-adjoint. Supported on G, then A must have the following structure Aij equal to Ei. I'm sorry for using I twice. I hope you'll understand from the context what do I mean. This and this is not the same I. Uh, e to the I alpha Ij times Hij where H is in my very nice cluster and alpha is in something which I call omega one of G. What do I mean by that? I mean alpha, uh, alpha of Ij is real and alpha of j i equal to alpha of i equal to minus alpha of i j. So these are anti-symmetric matrices, anti-symmetric uh, functions. But that essentially, that's exactly what happens when we have a matrix. We don't itself adjoin, so real on the diagonal, 
And whenever we're looking at an off diagonal entry, we can always write it as some e to the i alpha times, in our case, real non real negative entry. And here it would be e to the minus i alpha and the same thing in the same thing. So this thing tells us that we can get from any that our starting from our cluster of matrices. <coughs> We can get to any self adjoint matrix supported on G, and we can do it using these parameters, which essentially lives on a torus. So, essentially, we have here a, a torus acting, a torus acting on MG, taking it to all self adjoint, uh, to all self adjoint matrices. But now I'm only interested in this thing. So, if I let this thing, this alpha, get all possible values. I can get to every self adjoint matrix, but now I want these alphas to be just local perturbations. So I imagine these alphas to be very small. And then I can call this thing H sub alpha, where H zero is my H. So this would be H zero. And if I do this thing, then my eigenvalues can be ordered as functions pointwise as functions of these alphas. Now, I'm not going to get deep, deeply into that, but these alphas have several physical meanings. One is that this is the discretization of a magnetic Schrodinger operator. The other is that if I take a, the universal abelian cover of my graph, it's going to be a periodic graph, and these are going to be the quasi-momenta. So that's coming from a, from the language of, uh, of uh, solid matter. And then the eigenvalues as functions of these alphas would be the dispersion relation manifolds. And in the work of uh, Peter Saunak and Alicia Kohler, they call these things the twisted uh, Laplacian. So in, they use the, the term, they, they look at these things as characters of the of the homology of the abelian uh, cover. So a lot of naming for this simple uh, model. And what I want you to have in mind is that we're starting, we're taking H and we're tuning these alphas, playing with them a bit around it and ask what happens to these lambdas. And we're getting the following. Theorem. So we call it, we had phi n goes between n minus one and n minus one plus beta. So we kind of want to know what is phi n minus this n minus one. What is this deviation? And this deviation is going to be the following. So the Colico 2013. And Colin de Verdier, around the same year, when Colaico proved it, Colin de Verdier gave a, a different proof, which I really like. And that's hopefully what I'm going to show. Saying the following uh, under the assumptions that lambda n is simple and f and i not equal to zero for all i. When I don't write uh, lambda n of alpha, I just write lambda n, I mean at alpha equal to zero of my unperturbed operator. So under these, under these assumptions, then lambda n of alpha has critical point 
at alpha equal to zero of Bohr's index index lambda m at zero equal to phi m minus m minus one. So tells us exactly what is this deviation that we're looking at. So essentially, let me let me draw some caricature. So say that we're looking at the following graph. So essentially, which I'm going to show in a minute, <laughs> this index only care about uh, only care about what happens on the cycles. So I'm going to get two parameters. I can reduce everything to one, to alpha one here and alpha two here. I, I can draw a picture of say alpha one, alpha two, and lambda n. And whenever locally I get Whenever locally I get the minima, I know that phi n would be n minus one plus two. And say that I have some kind of a saddle point, then I know that phi n equal to n minus one plus one, etc. So just as a reminder, what is a Morse index? A Morse index, this is, if I write here the, probably it's not, it's right there. I'm not sure. No, we, we can't see. Okay. So, <clears throat> So index of lambda n at zero, this is by definition. Uh, we have two, two kinds of definitions. One is that this is the maximal V vector space, uh, maximal dimension of V vector space such that lambda n T V uh, is, <coughs> uh, has a local maximum, so it goes down. Let me draw it like this. Uh, so this is one, or we can write it down as <coughs> second derivative x t equal to zero, this thing would be negative. Or a nicer thing would be just talking about number of uh, negative eigenvalues of the Hessian of lambda n at zero. So it's weird because it's eigenvalues of the Hessian of an eigenvalue. But essentially, that's what we're 
looking at that how many negative eigenvalues the Hessian has. This is what I mean by an index. And well, uh, let me now convince you why uh, this theorem actually provides the other bounds that we got. Because a priori, this index, this is the number of eigenvalues of the Hessian. What is the dimension of the Hessian? It is the, it's, it's a map, an N, a E times E matrix. So this is an E times E matrix. So it has a priori E eigenvalues and we want beta, which is, we want <coughs> beta, which is E minus B plus one. And this is something very nice because here we see the first, I would say a very nice physical intuition. And this is going to be where gauge invariance gets into the roll. Uh, can you see the upper board like this? Yeah. Okay, it's fine. So what I'm going to do now, and this is one of the motivations coming from the magnetic point of view, is gauge invariance. And I'm, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to get deep into how this thing works in the continuum, but in this setting, say that we have H alpha, and we want to add to alpha some D of G. So recall, alpha is an anti-symmetric function on the edges. D of G, D takes G, a function, on the vertices and give you an anti-symmetric function on the edges. So this thing makes sense, okay? How does this thing would look like? So if I take this at the ij entry, it would look like h alpha ij times e to the i g i minus g J. Again, not the same I. Again, I'm sorry. <coughs> or I'm sorry that Euler didn't come with a better constant. Uh, so is this clear? Why this is this is simply the D D of G of IJ. But this thing is exactly taking e to the minus IG h alpha e to the i g at the i j entry where I use the notation e to the i g is simply a diagonal matrix of e to the i g one e to the i g two etc. So this thing tells me that shifting Shifting alpha by a derivative is actually unitary equivalent because this matrix is unitary. It's actually unitary equivalent to H alpha, which means that my eigenvalues don't change. So now when I want to calculate the Morse index, I want to know in how many directions I go down or how many negative eigenvalues of the Hessian has, this means that the Hessian in, in this direction is zero. So I actually need to mod out, I need to take, I need to take my space of anti-symmetric functions, my one forms, and mod out the ones coming from derivatives. This is exactly my first homology, whose dimension is the first Betty number. So this thing tells us that lambda n of alpha plus df equal to lambda n of alpha and tells us 
that index of lambda n at zero is bounded above. So this is a this is always a non it's a, it's a it's an integer a non-negative integer and it is bounded above by the dimension of omega one mod d omega zero omega zero functions which is by definition our first betty number so this tells us exactly where where does the bounce come from and why if we have a tree if we have a tree it means that any alpha can be gauged away so we call this gauge transformation and if we if we live on a tree any alpha can be gauged away so so introducing this thing doesn't do anything to respect it. Okay, now I can start with the proof. Any questions so far? Okay, so now the proof is essentially going to work out. Uh, I'm going to introduce some auxiliary quadratic form and work out some quadratic form equations, some quadratic <laughs> formulations. Uh, where should I do that? Uh, I really got some motivation to work with this after you told me I do it with okay. Uh, okay, so let's start with the first. So essentially what we are we, we want to define an object which or I think this object is very very related to the question you asked me yesterday. Uh, so Let's start with H alpha. And remember, we were interested in the Hessian with the Hessian of the eigenvalue, right? So, so lambda n equal to lambda n is equal to Fn H. Fn assuming that Fn is normalized. Now we can, a priori, we can change everything with alpha to take the Hessian and take the Hessian, right? But can you repeat that? What? Can you just repeat that? If I want Hessian of lambda n at zero, Hessian of lambda n at zero would be taking Fn alpha or taking, taking the Hessian of Fn alpha, H alpha, Fn alpha, right? Or in other words, taking second derivative, taking derivative of this guy is like taking second derivative of this guy, whatever Fn of alpha means, because there's something to be said. But now I want to say something else. Let's Instead of looking at Fn of alpha, I'm going to ask to define a different. So this was just a heuristic, but I want to define something which is not quite the same. I want to define a quadratic form. Q. <coughs> Q 
quadratic form on omega one. So I can think about it as a real symmetric matrix on omega one. And, and I define it as follows. So I only take the Hessian of H, but I keep Fn fixed. Q is equal to Fn. Let me emphasize that it is a zero Hessian of H alpha at alpha equal to zero times Fn of zero. Is this clear? Notice that Hessian of a matrix is a tensor. But I'm, but I'm uh, closing on it with two functions, so I get actually a matrix. And something that would become useful is that Q, say that we're, we're putting alpha Q alpha. So what does that? So this equals to take second derivative with respect to T of Fn H T alpha Fn evaluated evaluate T equal to zero. Okay. And this is something that we're going to use a lot. So uh, I'm writing it down and what do I want to do now? Yeah. So now essentially what I want to show is some equality in terms of quadratic forms. We're going to have the following. Strategy. So the strategy would be the strategy would be to show that Q can be can be decomposed into a block diagonal form. Say here this would be d omega zero. Q walks, so this space is omega one. So I'm going to take the part which is d omega zero, and I'm going to take some orthogonal part to that. So the orthogonal part would be the image. The, sorry, the kernel of D transpose Q. This would be an orthogonal decomposition. I need to, to show that. In this setting, Q would, would be block diagonal, where we're going to have two parts. We'll say Q1 and Q2, such that, Index. So now, when I'm talking about an index of a quadratic form, it's just it's simply the number of negative eigenvalues of the real symmetric matrix. Such that index Q1 is going to be n minus one. Index of the big Q is going to be phi n, and Q2 would be equal maybe up to some positive constant to the Hessian of lambda n at zero. So this is what we're going to do. Let me stop here for a moment to stare at it. Do you see why this gives us the needed result? 
the Mohs index would be the sum of these two. And this exactly tells us that the index of this guy plus the index of this guy equal to the index of this guy. So in a way, this quadratic form both hold the information about the nodal count and it somehow gives us a nice way of looking at the gauge invariance. Tell us this quadratic form changes in some way when, when, when we change the gauge, but for some fixed choice of gauge, this quadratic form is exactly the, the Hessian of our eigenvalue. Okay? Perfect. So this is now so this is now our goal. Okay, so I, th I think the first thing I want to do is show that the index of Q1 is equal to N minus one. So what is Q1? Q1 is exactly restricting my Q to the derivatives. And this is Q. So I just erased something that I wanted. And maybe I go down again. So okay. So I want to show that uh oh. We'll see that later on, and I won't write it. So let, let's let us ask ourselves what happened when Q acts on something in D omega, in D omega zero. So I'm interested in something of the form dg Q dg. Okay, these are the, the objects that I'm looking at now. And okay, let me use the second uh, line there. So this would be taking second derivative of Fn. And now I have H T D G Fn, everything evaluated at t equal to zero. But what is H T D G? TDG is like DTG. So this thing is nothing else than this thing is simply e to the minus ITG, H e to the ITG, right? And before even taking the derivative, I can already take the e to the ITG to the other side, it becomes e to the i t, it becomes plus i t g. So this thing would just be, let me write it just as maybe double dot, same, taking two derivative evaluated at t equal to zero of e to the i t g f n h e to the i t g f Are we okay. And now I want to say I want to do the following trick. Let me write it like this. Why can we do it? Because I just added a constant. This term 
is simply lambda n. Lambda n at zero is a constant. These two are they, these two are subtracted, and these two it's a norm one. So I can do this thing. Why why do I want to do it? So now I, I, I have three, I have a product of three things that I need to take second derivative of. So essentially I'm supposed to have like three choose two or something elements, but I want to say that whenever I take two derivative of this guy, I get Fn and I evaluate at t equal to zero, I just get Fn times this thing, which is zero. And if I do the same thing here, I get Fn times this thing, which is zero. So I'm only left with taking one derivative of this guy and one derivative of this guy, maybe twice. What happens when I take a derivative of this guy? We call that that's simply having the having tg at the diagonal. So when I take a derivative with respect to t, I get pointwise multiplication with g. So this thing is, is nothing else than maybe up to a factor of two, g pointwise multiplication fn h minus lambda n g pointwise multiplication with fn. Are we okay? And here comes the here comes where we need fn not be equal to zero at the vertex. When fn is not equal at the vertex at, at any of the i's, it means that multiplying g pointwise with fn is invertible. It's an invertible linear map. Since it's an invertible linear map, it means that the index, the index of this thing, if, I, if I'm running over as a linear space of g's, so now I want to run over a linear space of dg and ask when, when does my quadratic form goes down? And it's exactly as running over the linear, a linear space of g here, And I can just take the different linear space where I multiply by Fn. So it's exactly going to be the index of H minus lambda N. So this means, this entire thing means that the index of Q1 is equal to the index of H minus lambda N. How many negative eigenvalues H minus lambda N has? N minus one. Okay. Are we good? Okay. How much time do I have? Um, yeah, a bit more, 35 minutes. Oh, okay, so now let me... Let me show why why this why Q actually breaks down in this form. No, let me let me now show that index of Q is equal to phi n. I think why it breaks down is basically explained already. But yeah, so it, it's it's basically this thing. It's yeah. Uh, but I mean, I mean, I mean, if you don't have enough time, maybe start from the Q two part, which is oh, the, or, or the index. Yeah, let, let me start with the with the index q equal to phi n. Uh, so so index q equal to phi n is is the simplest brute force thing that that one needs to show. It's it one needs to do. So recall how is my H look like H alpha. H alpha at IJ looks like E to the I alpha IJ H IJ, right? So what happens when I'm taking the the Hessian with respect to, to this thing. I'm just going to, so blah, blah, blah. 
let me, oh, I, I just erased what I wanted. So how does Q alpha comma alpha look like? Want second derivative of Fn, H the alpha Fn at t equal to zero. Okay, so H t alpha would just be t here. So when I take a second derivative with respect to t, everything that happened is that I get uh, alpha minus alpha here. Okay, so I'll just get the minus alpha alphas here. Every, I'm just I just need to take the second derivative inside. So maybe h t alpha double dot t equal to zero is simply. A matrix with zeros in the middle, and at the sides, I just get minus alpha ij hij. Right? And it's real symmetric. And what happens when I act on it with fn from both sides? I simply get summing over all. <coughs> minus alpha i alpha i j it's important actually minus alpha h minus alpha squared h i j f n i f n J, so it's quadratic in alpha, it's diagonal with minus F I, F and I, F and J on the diagonal. So counting negative, negative eigenvalues of this quadratic form would be essentially on how many times F and I, J, F and I, F and J is negative. Okay, so this is, exactly the index q equal to phi m and and now i want to show that the other part is the hessian Let's put the iPad. And to do that, I actually want to, to point out two nice things about what does it mean to be in the kernel of this star of Q. So if alpha lives in the kernel of this star of Q, this means that Alpha, uh, alpha, this star Q, I don't know what I want to say here. Alpha in the kernel of this star Q, meaning that alpha Q df zero for all f. So this is what this thing means, right? Q is, Q is symmetric, going to the other side, no problem. And I want to claim that for such a situation, the first derivative so dt of ht alpha 
at t equal to zero times fn is zero, and also h minus lambda fn prime equal to zero, where fn prime, fn prime would be letting fn change with this alpha and taking the derivative. So how do I do that? Uh, essentially, I'm, I'm using the same, the same trick as before. So what is this thing? This thing means that I'm taking one derivative with respect to T, one derivative with respect to S of Fn H T alpha plus S DF minus lambda Fn H And essentially doing the same gauge invariance trick just for this part of the S, I get here just the T derivative of uh, G dot Fn. H T alpha G dot F M and so this thing is equal to zero. I have something wrong here. No, sorry. I just took one derivative. Yeah. So essentially, this thing equal to zero for every g which means that taking the derivative of ht alpha at equal to zero times fn equal to zero. So since this is here for every g, is this maybe, so this means that g dot fn comma, let me write it as h dot fn, Are we good? Let's have. So if this is if this holds for energy and Fn doesn't have zeros, so this so I, I get here any possible vector on this side. If it's zero for any possible vector on this side, this side must be zero. So it means that h dot Fn equal to zero when the derivative is in direction alpha, which is in the kernel of this tau q. There must be a reason that like, this is just an even function with respect to alpha, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just like you, for every side. Ah, that's, 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 that's why I forgot to say that, you're right. No, in it, that, it's lambda n of alpha, is even with respect to alpha. If alpha goes to minus alpha, lambda n doesn't change because it's simply taking the conjugate of the matrix. And the taking the conjugate of the yeah. matrix doesn't change. I mean, so then it's clear, like the claim immediately follows. Or I'm missing something. No, but here I'm, uh, you're taking second derivative. So 
I'm not sure why do you say that. No, I'm just saying like if uh, maybe I'm missing something. Um, uh, the, the fact that the first the, the fact that the first derivative of the eigenvalue vanish is clear. The fact that the first derivative of the uh, derivative of the matrix times the eigenvector vanish. I don't see how this follows from the. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. I remember who uh, there was a great mathematician that said that one should never uh, take derivatives in, in public. I'm now feeling, uh, feeling why. Uh, okay, so this tells us, so this tells us this thing. Now we want to get this thing. So essentially, let's take H minus lambda N, Fn, comma, Fn. This thing is, or maybe without this thing already, this thing is zero, right? It's zero by definition. And say that I let them let everything evolve with alpha, it stays zero. This is the defining equation. So I can take derivative with respect to alpha. So a derivative with respect to alpha would be h dot fn minus lambda n dot fn plus h where am i h minus lambda n f and dot this thing equal to zero this is the part that i want to say that equal to zero this is the part which I just showed it is equal to zero. And this is the thing that Roland just helped me to claim that it is zero. So this is zero, this is zero. It means that this thing is zero, okay? So this, this proves my claim. And this is essentially what we need in order to show that Q2 is equal to the Hessian. Right, so we, we're now looking just at Q restricted to such alphas. And we just worked out that pretty much every first derivative that we can take vanish. So when I'm going to take second derivative, I'm just going to don't care about the first derivatives. Okay? So, um, I think you see this board. <laughs> it feels like I'm good with time, so hopefully I'll be able to talk a bit about the numerical experiment that we did. Uh, okay, so I want to look at alpha Q alpha, where alpha is in kernel D star Q. All right, so this means that I'm looking at Fn HT alpha. Fn and I'm taking second derivative and exactly as we did before, I'm just shifting this thing by a constant so the derivative doesn't change. 
And the previous thing that I told you was that uh, all the, so maybe now, so now let me, let me look at the Hessian of lambda n, or I, I want the Hessian of lambda n with respect to kernel d star q. So I want to take the second derivative of lambda n of t alpha at t equal to zero. And this is going to be fn of t alpha h t alpha fn of t alpha. And essentially, I want to, show, to say that the, these two are equal. Okay? So, essentially, I want to just take I want to do this. I, I want to, I want, like essentially what I want to say is that whether I let Fn change or I fix Fn is the same. So if I don't have this thing here, then these two differ only by whether I let Fn change or not. Right, and that's exactly, and that's exactly what's going to be killed by the, by um, the argument of the first derivatives. So let me see if I, what I want to say here. Okay, so I'm looking at the, at the null equation. So the null equation would be fn t alpha h t alpha minus lambda n t alpha acts on fn t alpha. And this is just equal to zero everywhere. And I'm taking from every t and I'm taking two derivatives. And I get, I take t to zero. And now the thing is that my previous, what I previously said is it's exactly, I cannot take one derivative. <laughs> Whenever I take just one derivative. You, you don't have to, rather than you cannot. Yeah, I don't have to, I, I, can, I can throw these one derivatives away. So essentially this thing is equal to, Uh, Fn. So also, no. So I, I just need to to distribute the two dots, right? And if I take second derivative to this one, then this one kills this. If I take second derivative to this one then the right hand side kills everything. So the only thing that I'm left with is taking two derivatives to the middle guy. So that's F H double dot minus lambda N double dot N, which is exactly Q. This is exactly alpha Q alpha minus lambda n double dot. Is this okay? Sorry for taking derivatives in public. Uh, so essentially what we got is that plugging in alpha from the second, uh, from the second vector space into Q is exactly as, as taking 
second derivative as plugging in this alpha to the Hessian of lambda. And since the gauge invariance tells us that on the upper left block, lambda n, the, the Hessian is zero, so it's exactly proves that Q2 is equal to the Hessian. Up to possible two factor two that I keep neglecting. Are we okay? What, we, what you did on the bottom board is just, I mean, the fact that the second derivative of a unit vector, so it only changes tangentially. So it can't, like the second derivative of the Fn itself can never do anything because it's always tangent to Fn. So that, that's an issue I mean, because okay, like of a gauge. gauge. That's an issue of a, of a choice of gauge, but yes. So that uh, essentially it can- Ah, uh, wait, I think, no, I'm... okay, never mind. So, so in, when you do perturbation of an eigenvector, then you can only change it by an, by an imaginary part times the, the, the eigenvector. Mm -hmm. So, and this one, this is what can be gauged away. But essentially, yeah, that's, Okay, uh, so I think that I proved the theorem, right? All uh, right, ask two questions. One, yeah. what if you were in a continuous case, we are very familiar with this. Firstly, it would be in, in to build in this gauge invariance, you can take harmonic forms, you take a basis for the homology. Uh, and then the calc then the operator becomes the Laplacian plus a potential. And the calculation, I think, becomes much easier, all these second derivatives. Anyway, that's how I've done this calculation in some situations, but only for lambda zero. So the question is for the lowest eigenvalue, where of course the function's never zero and and the Hessian, I mean the you a global minimum. Uh, what is the, in the continuous case? So I guess it would be what you call dispersion relation. Uh, would this Hessian, what is the relation between this Hessian computation and uh, zero sets like you're trying? Uh, is there such a thing? That, that's, that's actually one of the main thing that puzzles me because it kind of, uh, currently, uh, first of all, it cannot work as is for the continuum case because here we are only get a finite uh, a finite number of uh, deviate like the deviation between the the nodal count and the n minus one is finite. Where in the continuum setting uh, we know that it can be as large as we want, so it cannot be something like this. And I actually would want to try to um, de discretize the system. To understand how this, uh, if this thing can be applied in some way to the continuous setting. So what do they? But, but since you said uh, the word dispersion relation in say block wave theory, uh, yes. What exactly. do, what's what's uh, the people's interpretation of this thing? There Nothing. Is no, there is no. There is no. It's still an open question. Uh, so Colin de Verde and Berkolaiko were trying, are still trying to work out. If the, the what would be the right analog? Okay, so for the smallest eigenvalue, there's a very clean answer for lambda zero. That's in my work with Phillips. It's a Hessian. We compute we compute the determinant of the Hessian in the continuous case completely, but only for the base eigenfunction where the uh, it's a global minimum. So you don't have these saddle points. <laughs> yeah, and then for the first eigenvalue, for the first eigenvalue, it's always uh, a minimum. We are always, and, and, then, and then the Hessian can be computed in terms of harmonic forms beautifully. That's what I'm pointing out. Okay. So I, okay, so you don't know for the other values that in the continuum. Okay, so that answers that. Thanks. Yeah, but I, I think that uh, that's exactly using the harmonic forms is exactly the is exactly what needed in this case to resolve the issue that that now you you need to be uh, in the continuum setting you need this answer to give you the possibility of high as possible uh, of of infinite dimension and i think this would be this would be exactly taking lo looking at the space of all harmonic functions but uh, anyway i'll i'll be happy to to 
to talk more about it. That's that's one of the main things that I'm interested that that, that interests me in this uh, question. Okay, thanks. Uh, Leo, just to give us some intuition, I'm just like if you pick a cycle and then you put like a divergence free vector field on that cycle, like just going yeah. in one of the directions, what can you say about what it does to the Eigen function? I mean, to an Eigen function. So, so it's, a, it's a good question because the whole question of nodal count becomes irrelevant once you introduce alpha. Because the while the spectrum still is still real, the vectors, the eigenvectors are no longer real. And in a way, uh, there is some, at least for the metric graph case, I can show that as long as you're as long as you're in a, in a critical point of alpha, being a, being a critical point of alpha means that you get eigenfunction which is. Uh, real up to a constant but and whenever you break this thing so it's as if you 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 your eigenfunction starts say if you're in a in a continuum setting so this this uh, proof holds also for metric graph and in such case you would see that a, an eigenfunction that starts like this would Starts wrapping around, so it, it is no longer real, and the no, and the and the zero counts becomes kind of like a winding number. But when you take alpha from one side to one to, to the other side, this winding number changes. This winding number change its sign. It's like the the. You reflect this the, the chirality changes. So if I have like just one semigraph is a, just a cycle, and then I have some something that looks like a cosine, and I put a little bit of like a divergence free thing on the cycle, it's just adding to the cosine a little bit of i times sine. Right. So if you had something of this form. <laughs> I, I, I don't take just the, the cycle graph because this one has no uh, simple eigenvalues, so I add something. Uh, so if you take this thing, once you start inserting a, a non-trivial flux, a non-trivial magnetic flux, a non-trivial, then this thing would start going around like this and this is one of my uh, so and, and and you can and one, one thing that you can do by gauging the way is actually taking all of this flux into one point where you break it so you can just write it down. <coughs> so it is uni unitary equivalent to the same system where you don't have, when you don't have the, these fluxes here, but just from here to here, you have a jump of e to the i alpha. Uh, so in a way, it's, ta it's taking all of these windings and, and take them here. And of course, yeah. a skewed periodic condition. If you cut this interval open, normally you would have just periodic condition, but here it is periodic condition. Yeah, so, so something that can be seen in these cases is that we can use it to define the nodal count for any metric, for any metrics, we don't, for any real metrics. We don't need all of the of diagonals to be negative. We just need to count with respect to the sign of the of the of diagonal. So the entire theorem holds if we replace the nodal count with the signed nodal count. And we're actually 
using this to to so we got here this uh, we could call it the, the nodal defect or nodal surplus the the difference between phi n and n minus one which is some number between zero and beta and if we just take just take the histogram of this thing so so pick the random G say uh, in my so for example my recent numerics was uh, I think it was three regular with m equal to one hundred fifty and just uh, pick. And just uh, pick a uh, random G matrix. So say that uh, HIJ. So I, I, I did it for several different random clusters. Uh, so we can take them all to be. Uh, say uniform on minus uh, minus one zero, or we can take them to be uh, Gaussian. IID. And just have a look at the have a look at the at the distribution of these indices. Then the distribution or histogram of phi n minus n minus one. So this would be something that range between zero up to beta, and it's always symmetric around beta over two and is centered with the variance of order beta. Beta, well, something like, something like beta over four. So it's very close to binomial distribution usually, or maybe a, maybe a squeezed, a more squeezed binomial distribution. And we, for the metric graphs, we, have, we actually have several proofs for this kind of results. For the discrete graphs, we have no proof. And we still see this thing. And you see the same behavior over and over. In this picture, the randomness of G is quenched, right? You kind of fix G and yeah. for most G will have yeah. this. Yeah, but I did it now. I did it enough times so that you can you can also say that you yeah it's fixed G yeah. and another thing that is interesting that I recently found out in the numerics which is somehow related to to yesterday talk <coughs> is that you can you can you can talk about this thing when restricted for for a fixed n. And for a fixed n, so that's like would be what would be the average number of this thing for a fixed n. And apparently it is very much depends on the n, and we have an inversion symmetry. So for a fixed n, for a fixed n, we see so we have n ranging from zero up to capital N, and this would be capital N over two. It's has this weird shape, kind of like a tilted sign shape, 
with a very clear inversion when, when you take some n and you take capital N minus this n, then you get inver inversion over beta over two. So this might explain the symmetry, the beta over two symmetry. And this might give us a way to relate the nodal count that, for example, Nikhil talked about last time about the nodal count for the very low part of the spectrum. And this would give us the very high part of the spectrum. So this is a, a purely experimental results. We still have not, not a proof or any illusion for why this thing happens. Yeah, can you just repeat? So the second picture is to fix. So this is a, the, the, under the, the entire same model. Now, instead of taking the histogram of all of these things, Right, I, I'm taking here. I, I'm when I'm taking, I say taking random of this time. I, I'm taking like I don't know one thousand realizations, and I'm averaging over these one thousand realizations. So here I took all of these guys for all of the one thousand realizations, and I put them in the histogram. But then instead of doing that, and and the left one is really you can quite like for most realizations of both G and H, you will see this function, right? Just as a function of I, I, which I'm not a. sure about the quenched. I'm not. I, I guess so, but I'm not sure about no. the quenched. I need to, to have a look at it because I'm always looking at the. I'm always averaging over everything. Okay. Okay. Uh, but this, so this picture is like averaging over this over the n. So here I'm just, so here, or here I'm saying, okay, give me fix n and give me the average of this value over the 1000 realizations that I guessed. Okay. And the average, and if I don't put an average, then this. very nicely, around, like fits very nicely around this thing. And one other thing is that if I let the degree of the regular graph grow, then this thing becomes more and more flat. So this behavior that we're looking at here somehow relates to the degree of the random regular graph. And we have some kind of, uh, Reasoning, we, we, we think that this may be related to the random, to the random wave model, uh, to, to the conjecture that locally, that, that locally eigenvectors look like eigenvectors of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the deregular tree. So that's essentially what I had to say. Thank you. Leo. I already took too much of your time asking questions myself, so maybe we'll take everything else offline. Okay, so maybe one last comment. Uh, today is my 35th birthday, so thank you for celebrating with me in this, uh, <laughs> in this occasion. <laughs> Happy birthday.